Hello, KubeCon. Welcome to our session. I'm Alexander Kanievsky. I'm Cloud Software Architect working for Intel. And today, with my colleague, we are going to talk about something interesting in the runtime stack. Hello, KubeCon. My name is Christian Litke. I work for Intel Finland as a Linux and Cloud Software Engineer. Maximizing workloads performance with smarter runtimes. We will take a look at performance optimization, how Kubernetes models hardware, detour into hardware domains, and then talk about smart runtimes. So let me first start with a theory. A performance optimization comes down to a very known problem of noisy neighbors. We all have dozens or hundreds of workloads running in our nodes. And all of those workloads, they have a different characteristics, different life cycles, and so on. So one thing which I want to say in the very beginning, the silver mood doesn't exist. Even though if you have some good algorithms to uh, optimize one set of workloads, most probably for our set, it will have differences. And the reason for that is what, like we all have differences in the CPUs, caches, memory, and other hardware resources. The usage of patterns of those resources also differs. What is important is what you need to understand how those resources are used, how you can measure them, and how you can react in those uh, events of the life cycle of those workloads. Today, in our scope, is just a container runtime. Cryo, container B, and some interfaces what is connecting those pieces together. And even though uh, here I'm talking about the theory of the things, we, we have a project which is called CRI Resource Manager, where we validated most of our theories, uh, theories and we have practical examples of what can be achieved by extending the runtimes. But let's talk about how the resources are organized, how we can look at them. In the Kubernetes world, the pristine and vanilla installation of uh, Kubernetes, you have a very simplified model for resources. Everything is one big shared pool. Every CPU is equal. Every memory region is, again, one big shared set of resources. And obviously, in this setup, you are not able to provide too much of a control. You have some priorities, but that's it. To fully embrace a control, you need to start dividing those resources into a smaller channels. So we can, when you can measure and control them. And when people are thinking about the divisions of uh, standard compute resources, they immediately came to the idea of NUMA. And this current implementation of uh, NUMA in Kubernetes, you still have one big set of uh, shared resources for CPUs. You still have one big shared set of memory uh, regions. You have possibility to do some exclusive allocations, but it's still limited. And even if we look at the newer development in that area, you have some improvements. You can select multiple memory regions, but still, these memory regions will be shared resource between the exclusive and shared allocations of our workloads. So when we are talking about NUMA, it might be not enough uh, for a boundary of division of the resources on the system. And for reason for that, we need to look more deeper in the history of NUMA. Two decades ago, we had a setup of a system where you have multiple CPUs, single memory controller, you had a memory bus, and when all of those CPUs were accessing core memory. That was called uniform, uniform memory access or symmetric multiprocessing. However, this setup was not really scalable. And when the uh, architecture evolved to uh, NUMA, non-uniform memory access, what it means? It means that you have groups of cores, you have independent memory controllers, you have independent set of memories, and you have interconnect between those groups. So each of these groups is becoming a NUMA domain. 
And you can have multiple of those domains. And you can have multiple different links between them, not necessarily like a full mesh interconnect, but uh, different sizes, different connections. And that is really model or system dependent. That's why this idea of non-uniformity is coming from. And in, when you're optimizing, you need to understand how the access between the memory regions is actually uh, affecting your performance. But even if we double click on the memory, nowadays the memory became also a heterogeneous resource. We all know about the standard memory, DRAM. But when we have already the other types of memory, for example, the Intel obtained persistent memory, it's still connected to the same memory sockets, it's still DIM interface. However, uh, even though it's seen as a normal system memory, it has a bit different performance characteristics. And to fully utilize it by applications, it would be good to uh, understand those differences. But that's not the end of the story. Mm. Very soon, we will have uh, another bus, which is called Compute Express Link. And one of the profiles for this bus is a memory extension. And by memory, it means what we're going to have a possibility to attach additional memory uh, to the controllers or to the, to the nodes. And that's not going to be like uniform type of memory. You can have different types of memory with different performance characteristics. This memory can be hot plugged and so on. So all of these different memory regions will be seen in Linux as a separate NUMA memory nodes. So if we double click to a CPU box, we can see what uh, like the modern CPUs have multiple physical cores. They might be different by the frequencies, but uh, around, it can be also other differences. For example, the hyperthreads. So you can have multiple hyperthreads per physical core. And those hyperthreads are sharing the same resource on the low level, meaning L1 and L2 caches. So one of the division boundaries can be also physical core versus uh, one, one hyperthread. When we have L3 cache, or last level cache before you reach the memory, this already becomes a shared resource between multiple cores within the same socket or die. And the architecture is not uh, something what is static. Uh, the architecture of CPUs are evolving. And in new versions or new generations, you might have an absolutely different split of resources, like what is core, like what is the L3 cache domain, and so on. And that actually also goes to even more uh, deeper separation of the things. So you can have um, domains split physically or logically. So for example, you can have multiple dice per one physical package, or you might have a well, logical subnormal clustering within one physical package. So based on that, we need to understand what Linux and actual hardware looks like in terms of hierarchy. So you have physical components like the sockets or packages in Linux terms. You have dice for multi-chip CPUs. And then you have inside the CPU cores. And those CPU cores is practically can be grouped into same, some pool or some, some zone of resources which contains the CPU caches, memory, IO, and so on. You have possibility to have inside this small group shared set of resources and exclusively allocated set of resources. And when you can bound your workloads in, into these small groups. The next problem or next question will be, of course, like what if I have a workload which is bigger than this small group? Well, you still have ability to uh, uh, group on the higher level. So you can have a parent nodes or parent virtual groups 
uh, which spans across like multiple dives into one socket. And when you can have a proper accounting for all of those, which is practically like sum of the resources of all the child nodes. So to reiterate, right? when we are talking about the resource zones where the workloads are bound, it's good to have a good understanding what your physical layout of a system looks like. And that might be a lot different based on generations, based on the vendors and so on. Because in different generations, you have differences in how memory is organized, how the caches are divided, how uh, IO buses are connected. You can have different types of memory even though we will be connected to the same memory controller. For Linux, it will be visible as separate NUMA numbers. But what we actually want to understand is what, how those separate reported by the Linux controller, by, by the Linux kernel, NUMA numbers can be grouped into one logical and usable resource zone. We have possibility at the moment to say which zone can be used, but what we don't have, and this is something what I hope will be improved in the next years of the Linux, is the ability to control how much memory or how much of our resources can be used per zone for our application. And when we have even more harder tasks to understand and fix is how to understand the lower details of a workload, for example, the working set size, to have a good split of understanding what is the hot size of the memory used by application versus the cold area of, of the pages used by application. So going first, we have caches. We can, at the moment, split them. We can assign the workloads to the caches. However, we have a problem where, where first of all, the amount of uh, cache classes is limited. So you cannot assign each of your container to separate class. Second, the configuration of the caches is uh, something what is really hard by the time. We need to come up with a good abstraction and we think what class is one of the good abstractions what we can use in Kubernetes or in CNC world. Meaning we have a classes example like gold, silver, bronze. And when we have a node level mapping between those classes to the actual parameters of the hardware. So simplified UI for containers, deep knowledge on the node level. And even though if it's done for the caches, we have another resource which is also can benefit from the same approach. And I'm talking here about the block IO. This is virtual resource known by Linux kernel where you can define the priorities and uh, limits of a block storage. But again, like multiple nodes in the heterogeneous cluster might have different configurations of uh, storage devices on the node. You don't need to expose that to the end user how to control it. But what you want to do is again, probably with class-based abstraction for consuming of those resources. And that allows you to, again, properly split and control those resources on per node basis. So all of this, I, I, the reason why I talked is what we have possibility to divide the resources. We have the possibility to measure them. Those are vendor specific. But now when we have understanding how to divide, how to measure, now we need to have a control for it. So smarter runtimes. Ever since its introduction, Kubernetes has enjoyed an increasingly wide scale adoption across public and private clouds. As a result, both the spectrum of workloads and the diversity of the cluster hardware is rapidly growing. We have AI databases, content streaming, network function virtualization, uh, automotive edge, running anywhere from a virtualized generic public cloud, uh, something like Google Cloud, uh, to a bare metal custom cloud with accelerators, for instance, 5G edge with FPGAs. 
Kubernetes is literally taking over the world. While this is a positive problem, it is also causing some headache for us. Kubernetes node resource management is implemented in Kubelet, the node agent. Kubelet has a simplistic view and limited understanding of the hardware. Moreover, it comes with a single one-size-fits-all resource, resource allocation algorithm. Now, while this algorithm is good for many common cases, critical workloads on bare metal require more optimal hardware-aware resource assignment for acceptable performance. Similarly, workloads in domain-specific clusters often require custom resource allocation logic. The one-size-fits-all algorithm cannot scale to satisfy all these requirements. We need multiple resource allocation and assignment algorithms and support for custom logic. That sounds a little bit like we need support for pluggable algorithms, but where to plug these? We have very few candidates, either the kubelet or the runtime itself. Kubelet already hosts one policy, so should we extend it with pluggable policies? Well, that would be problematic for many reasons. First of all, we would like to keep the orchestration hardware agnostic. And as it is critical infrastructure, we would like to keep it as simple as possible. Now, Kubelet is already complex. Adding pluggable policies would definitely increase its complexity. Luckily, another option suggests itself, the runtime. Let's plug custom algorithms to the runtime and make it smarter. The Kubernetes APIs are predominantly declarative. The user describes what a workload needs and orchestration decides how this will be achieved. This is true for the resource API too. Uh, container resources are requested in abstract terms. For instance, 3000 millicores and not cores one, three and five. But the API between the kubelet and the runtime, the container runtime interface is fully imperative. It carries concrete resources and related parameters. To bridge this gap, the kubelet turns abstract resource requirements into concrete resource assignments using its allocation algorithm. But what would we need instead? So let's separate the what from the how and leave resource requirements unresolved in the kubelet. Let's update the CRI API to allow passing abstract resource requirements to the runtime itself. Let's extend the runtime by pluggable custom resource allocation and assignment algorithms, and an API that these algorithms can use to resolve pot-spec requirements to concrete resources. In other words, let's make the runtime smarter. There already exists an extension point for plugging resource allocation algorithms into runtimes. This is NRI, the node resource interface, container the subproject in draft status. It is described as a new interface for managing resources on a node for pods and containers. It was largely inspired by the container network interface, which is used by runtimes to handle multiple implementations of the container network stack. We share common interest with NRI. It aims improving node resource management with a structured API and plugin design for containers. We would like to do pretty much the same. It wants additional interfaces to customize and con a containers runtime environment. We also would like the same. NRI's current focus, however, is on better control and more flexibility for injecting devices into containers. This we would like to extend a bit. So ideally, we would like to make NRI the primary integration point for extending the runtime and allow any vendor to plug in their any resource allocation and optimization algorithm. So how do we want to extend NRI? Well, NRI taps into container lifecycle events and invokes corresponding plugin API functions. The plugin receives information about the event and then it selects and configures resources and responds back with data about how to set up the container. The current NRI events are creation and removal of pods and containers. To enable more generic support for resource optimization algorithms, NRI needs to tap into a few more events. To enable smart algorithms, NRI needs to pass all the necessary information to plugins. To allow proper container setup, NRI plugins needs to be able to pass back enough data for correct container configuration. 
So finally, let's look at the plugin invocation mechanism. The current implementation is a hook-like one-shot API with a separate exec for every request. For stateful plugins, we need another mechanism with minimal overhead, probably a protobuf-based API over gRPC or TTRPC. So eventually we would like NRI to become the common resource integration point for all OCI compatible runtimes. Therefore, the NRI core and data structures need to be runtime agnostic. Adaptation to any corresponding runtime specific bits should happen in the runtime itself. Container is already integrated with NRI, but we need to extend on that a bit. Uh, we have to hook into a few more additional lifecycle events and make sure that all the necessary data is passed back and forth to the plugins. Also, the current code ignores plugin replies altogether. That has to be updated to modify containers according to the plugin decisions. Once we have ironed out all these details with containerd, we can take uh, cryo and integrate it to NRI as well. CRI needs to evolve also to provide better support for smarter, smarter runtimes. Smart algorithms need declarative resource requirements and the separation of what in the kubelet from the how in the runtime. To do this, CRI needs to pass through podspec resource requirements verbatim. Smart algorithms with better efficiency also need a few group operations. VM-based runtimes need full information about all container resource requirements for sandbox creation. Uh, also, to optimize the co-location of related containers, it is better to get a single request for creating all the related containers at once. We also need the ability to update multiple containers with a single request. And finally, uh, we would like a dedicated API for container state monitoring. We want to allow clients to subscribe for container state change events, then trigger and deliver notifications from the runtime when such an event occurs. So based on the things what we just uh, provided to you, there are three things what we want you to take home out of this presentation. First of all, is a, about the hardware. The hardware is evolving and the hardware is changing. All the assumptions about how the hardware works might be changing next day. So it means no one single algorithm which will satisfy all the needs. We need to have a flexibility. Second thing about the Kubernetes. Kubelet holds the information of what and what sh should be run, what is the priority of the things. But we need to split the what and how. That is about the runtimes. Runtimes now contains some information about the how, like Linux container, Windows OS, uh, Windows OS containers, or VM-based container, and so on. So we want to have the runtimes to control the full how part of how containers are run. And we want to have a plugins in this interface. So what more custom logic and vendor-specific logic, so uh, special installation logic can be extended. On that, we have reached the end of our presentation. Me and Christian are available on the GitHub or in the Kubernetes Slack, and we are happy to talk more and more details about all the things what we presented today and what we are doing for hardware performance optimizations. We will be available today after the sessions for live Q&A. So welcome and thank you for participating in our session today. Thank you, KubeCon. Thank you.